Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Frances Saunders. I'm the president of the Institute of Physics. And I wanted to welcome you here on behalf of the science community. Uh, this is one of a number of conversations that we're at the Institute were, were stimulating between the science and the arts, and particularly between physics and the arts. And I think it's really interesting if you think about what's happening at the moment in terms of the, the, the range of stories that are being told about scientists and physicists as people. Uh, and this production of Oppenheimer is obviously one of those which I think will really grab our imagination. But I think that that whole business about uh, physicists and scientists not just being faceless people in white coats, but being individuals with personalities, with stories to tell and so on, is a really interesting opportunity for us to engage between the scientific community and the arts community. So I'm really looking forward to this morning's discussion and debate. And I now will just hand you over to Erica to take forward the proceedings. Thank you, very much. Thank you Francis. <clears throat> so, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How wonderful to see such a terrific turnout. Um, I was just saying to some of our guests that this is a little bit early in the morning for those of us who work in the theatre, so it's particularly impressive that you've, you've all come. Um, we actually don't have a terrific amount of time for what you, you might already think is a huge subject. And I'm hoping we can draw out a number of different aspects of it. So just a little forewarning, a little parish notice. We will go on a little bit further than advertised till about 25 past 11, which buys a minute or two more to try and understand uh, the events of the 20th century. <clears throat> <coughs> so um, I'm... Absolutely thrilled to have such a distinguished and, and fascinating panel with me this morning. Um, I, I, I'm going to give very brief and completely um, uh, unreasonable and unrepresentative uh, introductions to all of them and then allow them, in conversation with you, to talk a little bit uh, about Tom's play, but also about the events that it uh, portrays and the impact that we are left with uh, some years later. So first of all, on my left, Tom Morton smith who wrote Oppenheimer, uh, and I should have said right at the beginning, I'm very aware some of you will have seen the show already, and uh, quite a number of you are going to see it this afternoon, so we're going to endeavour not to spoil the things that are not obvious about the events of the play <laughs> in the course of the afternoon. Uh, to his left, Erica Wagner, who is, as I'm sure most of you know, the former literary editor of The Times, has written very extensively about a range of extraordinary people, uh, as well as extraordinary books, uh, but including, and most recently, uh, people, men who have uh, embarked on astonishing science and engineering projects. And the moment you're writing a book about the man who built the Brooklyn Bridge. Yes, indeed I am. Washington Roebling is his name. Fascinating uh, thought to build a bridge <coughs> just there that's become so iconic. Um, to her left, Frank Close, who is a physicist, so it's all right. <laughs> Frank can make sure we don't talk nonsense about physics. Um, Frank, a, a fellow of Exeter College in Oxford, uh, at one time the head of theoretical physics at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory. Uh, again, acclaimed for his writing on science, so we, we will talk, of course, as you'd expect, about what does it mean to try and write about science and write for a, for a broad audience as well as a specialist audience. And Frank, uh, most recently, has written a book called Half-Life, in which you do deal with, as you put it, the other side of the Manhattan Project. That's right, yes. I mean, the, the Brits were involved in, in this in a big way, and there was a man called Bruno Pontecorvo who disappeared through the Iron Curtain in 1950, and was he the missing atom spy? Well, you'll have to buy the book to find out. <laughs> Frank is already persuading Tom to write a play about it, so we'll be fine. Um, <clears throat> to my right, Alok Jar, who's the uh, science correspondent for ITV, but... but uh, more pertinently, has written across all sorts of ideas about modern science and the history of science, and has been particularly intrigued, or, or certainly at one time intrigued, by science which leads inevitably or otherwise to great destruction. Would you say a little bit more about that? Well, actually, bizarrely, it's meant to be an optimistic book. Um, <laughs> I, I know it doesn't sound like that, but um, um, uh, based around some of the ideas of how scientific endeavour and uh, our understanding of science could lead to the end of the world, gives you a handle on how to stop that. That was my, that was my aim in that book. Thank you very much. And um, just here to his right, Angus Jackson, the director of Oppenheimer. Um, so for those of you who've seen it, you will understand that Angus took on an extraordinary challenge and has risen to it completely magnificently. But a little fact that I didn't know about him when we asked him to come and direct the play was that he studied physics and philosophy at university. So uh, the perfect man for the task. So <clears throat> for those of you who haven't seen the show yet, it is, uh, to my mind, a kind of searing and also extraordinary, ambitious way of telling the story not just of 
one man, although centrally one man, but as I said earlier, truly some of the most significant and uh, defining events of the 20th century. What on earth possessed you, Tom, if I might start there, to tackle such a subject? W where did it come from and why did you want to, to do it now? Um, oh, yes, that's a big question. Why did I do it? Um, <clears throat> I think uh, I'd had in my head um, and I, um, the idea of writing about physics on stage for a long time. I think um, certainly some of my favourite plays when I started getting inter interested in theatre were um, Tom Stoppard, Michael Frayne, and um, and and you, you know that's that was my first introduction to, to physics and to, to science was through playwrights. Um, and uh, when I was invited by the RSC to come, um, we they ran some workshops. Um, to, with some writers to, um, it, the idea was to have us work with uh, the vocal departments and the, uh, we had a rhetoric coach come and work with us um, to see if the, the um, tools that the RSC has for actors to kind of help them um, inhabit a, an epic spa uh, stage like the RST or the, the Swan, um, whether they were of any use to, to writers. Um, if they would inspire an epic idea. Um, and then we got to pitch an idea and I pitched, um, I pitched Oppenheimer. I, 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 um, I thought that's the biggest thing I can think of. <laughs> um, what, what better subject to, to, try and, um, to, to try and put on a, on a stage like this that, um, though yes, intimate, allows you to, to talk directly to the audience about really big um, events and ideas. Um, I think it's so important now um, that nuclear weapons have never gone away. They were, um, they were they cast a big sh shadow over, um, I certainly felt it kind of growing up in the 80s, there was the, the threat of nuclear annihilation was, was always somewhere in the back of my mind. Um, where I grew up, uh, there was a nuclear bunker um, quite close where we used to go and picnic next to. So um, that was kind of a big influence on, on having those ideas in my head. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of those things that if you're talking about uh, the world today, yeah, and um, whether you're talking about um, an energy crisis or uh, climate change, or whether you're talking about North Korea or Iran or even Scottish independence, the um, the idea of uh, nuclear power and nuclear weapons is so pertinent to where we are now and how the world is now. Yes. Um, that um, it felt like the perfect time to kind of go back and, and see um, the birth of it and see the point and the circumstances um, which, which kicked uh, uh, the atomic age off. And I suppose it, you allude to this, but it's true that, it, that the next bit's our fault, of course, because we loved it. And um, it felt very good timing for the RSC in a very particular sense. So next door in the Royal Shakespeare Theatre, I've directed The Christmas Truce, which plays in repertory with Love's Labour's Lost and Love's Labour's Won, Much Ado About Nothing. And it's worth mentioning that only in the sense that we were keen, as many people have been in throughout uh, 2014, and I suspect going forward into the next two or three years, to think deeply about the First World War <clears throat> in the commemorative years as we think about the 100-year 100, 100 anniversary. The difficulty, of course, is that when you're thinking about 1914 and the true streets, very specifically, of those few months, you're talking about a moment of innocence. And so when I read Tom's play, there seemed to me, and it seems clearer and clearer, and, you know, now seeing it on the stage, that the journey from a kind of innocence in, at the beginning of the century to 1945 and the events uh, towards the end of the play is an enormous journey that defines us morally as well as scientifically and politically. So to that point, Erica, I wonder if you would just give us a sense of what are the challenges of telling a story like this and, and, and why are we so interested in, in telling a number of stories like this right at the moment? I think about the films that have recently been released, been released a fascination with the history of science and the history of theory. Well, um, I think as... as um as Frances was uh, alluding to in her introduction, um, you know, and this is something I find, I'm not a scientist, I'm a lay person, someone who studied the arts, but always fascinated by science and engineering. Um, the way that I can access these technological developments is through the stories of the people who made these technological developments. Um, so I think... Um, you know, I'm thrilled that we seem to be in a moment where there are a lot of 
these stories around, whether it's Tom's wonderful play, whether it's the theory of everything. Um, however much these stories as they're told, um, Tom Stoppard's new play is about neuroscience, um, however much these stories, and of course they are stories, um, approach the hard science of the subject, I think they can give an audience, me, um, a desire to find out more. They're a, they're a wonderful kind of window into this work, which otherwise can seem abstract, inaccessible yes. to people who aren't trained. Yeah, I, I made the mistake of saying to <clears throat> Angus and Tom that the science in the play made me feel clever and they gave me a slightly withering look. <clears throat> and then having met a couple of scientific colleagues with us in the last few days, I realised that actually the science that they explained to us isn't as complicated as I thought it was. But I did feel great that I'd followed it. Absolutely. But do you think there's, do you think there's more to it? I wonder if, because of course the story of Oppenheimer treats as such uh, big moral decisions, political decisions... Are we looking back at these moments of um, scientific progress because we're, we're, we're searching for that idealism or the loss of idealism or the loss of innocence? Well, I think this is a very particular moment. I think there are not many moments in the history of the world where we say before and after. Yes. And this is one of the most profound ones. You know, the day before the bomb the world was a wholly different place. And I also completely agree um, with Tom as, you know, someone, you know, and it is interesting now, it seems to me, my son who's 15, when I was 15, I was really, in 1984, whatever, I was really scared that the world was gonna blow itself to hell. It was really, really frightening. We seemed, we have other things to fear now, but still the scale of that destruction is there. So I think it is absolutely a, a really, um, you know, it's a perfect moral moment yes. to examine and to set as this play, it seemed to me, I saw it last night, wonderfully does, the excitement of these people working on this project, the joy that they feel in pursuing these extraordinary ideas to the very limit and then understanding mm. what the limit looks like. Yes. Yes, what they've done or what they might yeah. do. And Angus, how has it felt to make the show, in, to make it now? Has it felt to you as though it speaks to a particular moment now or, or, or is it a kind of timelessly important story or both? Uh, uh, that's a good question. I think, it's, the, it, I, I think one of the things making it now is the, is the appetite for it. it I, you know, I don't know, you know, we go through our careers doing, doing different shows about different things. Um, so you're aware when you right today that you get 20 people drawing these equations if you can see the floor they've left the floor for us it starts clean at the start of the evening that that there's a currency to that which is is fun um i don't know in terms of of making it now uh politically uh, you know what you're aware if you sit on this stage and say a weapon of mass destruction yes. it probably means something uh, very visceral to us which perhaps it wouldn't have you know if we'd made this show 15 20 years ago yeah. So I think you've got those two things that run alongside each other. And I'm startled by the, the relationship, I, perhaps I shouldn't be, but the relationship between America and the rest of the world that's portrayed in the play, that <clears throat> when you see how much that has changed in, in these years that have gone by since, it's a sort of obvious point, but the uh, naivety with which, or the, the straightforwardness with which America felt responsible for trying to bring the war to a close and to, and to win the scientific race, you know, it feels like a wholly different time. To I now. think we're much more suspicious now of the idea of good guys yes, and bad guys. Yes, quite. Which brings me perhaps neatly to <laughs> so the good guys the or the good bad guys? Guy, the good oh. guy. No, I wanted to ask you from your perspective, what has it what has it done to science? How has it changed physics, scientists, the world that, that you occupy? Well, w one thing that Erica said, I also, at the age of 15, was very worried. Unfortunately, that was 1960. So <laughs> uh, it certainly did change things. And as a scientist myself, I had sort of the experience a couple of years ago when the discovery of the Higgs boson was announced, the same sense that those kids had back in 1945 when they first exploded the bomb. 
And it was the fact that for a long time in advance of that, you know, we all knew in our hearts that was the way that the world worked. But when finally the announcement was made at CERN that this is how it is, it was an incredibly emotional moment. And we knew for all time, we now know this fact. And you know, if a thunderbolt had come to the CERN auditorium at that moment and Charlton Heston's voice had been berating us for going where we had no right, I wouldn't have been surprised. <laughs> And I had that sense, uh, without spoiling the play for people, that the moment when they finally achieve the atomic bomb test and it exceeds all their expectations and they realise what they have finally achieved, to me that was a very powerful emotional moment that I felt it very much. And then of course there's the, the moral issues come to bear and they realise what they have done. And it occurs to me you know, that now the concept that science or physicists have known sin and judgments take place. I mean, we, we all know, you know the Feynman on the Challenger Inquiry and Hans Bethe and Oppenheimer and so on. I see in the audience here people pretty well of my generation and that is the age of the people as we know them and as we judge them. But how many people in here are in their 20s? Can you just stand up a second so we can remind ourselves? I'm not wanting to make Bravely an example Bravely admitting it. Right. Go on. Thank you for coming. Right, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The average age was 25. Um, Klaus Fuchs makes an appearance last night. Everybody has heard of him as a spy. Ted Hall, who probably nobody's ever heard of, was so successful as a spy because he wasn't found out. He was 18. Oppenheimer himself was only 39. These were kids doing it. And what you bring out very well, Tom, in the play is the excitement of these kids. They've got something Scienti they've gone into science because they're excited by wanting to know nature. And here is something that they are trying to do. And when they do it, their reaction is their response to the universe. Then you see them realize um, what happens next. And that's, of course, everything else is history, so to speak. <laughs> but that, 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 that was the moment. I I'm interested, though, do you mean that it's harder now at in, the, in one's early years as a scientist, to, to in a way pursue the science for its own sake, having, that's a wonderful phrase, having known sin. I, is it now true that actually one is always aware of the implications or applications of the science that you're, that you're doing? Well, the, the, the nature of science has certainly changed, and in a way perhaps the Manhattan Project was the beginnings of it. Yes. That, uh, I mean, I mentioned the discovery of the Higgs boson, where of the order of 10,000 scientists, engineers, technicians around the world have worked together, and that is big science. The Manhattan Project, at its height, had the order of 100,000 people. And before it started, the nature of scientific research, uh, one, two, maybe three people might work on an experiment together. Um, the cyclotron of, of Lawrence would have fitted on this stage. So the Manhattan Project was completely and utterly different. And my understanding of the question, why was it Oppenheimer, for example, that General Groves worked with and not one of the Nobel laureates or others that were around there? My understanding is that Groves found all the academics he spoke to, typical ivory tower people. Only Oppenheimer had the insight that this was an industrial project that he was taking on board. It was something qualitatively different. 70 years later, science, not just in, in physics in my own area, but you know, now the Human Genome Project. Science is big science. It's vast numbers of people working collaboratively together. Um, it didn't directly come out of the, the Manhattan Project, but the sort of pressures that Oppenheimer felt. He had to deliver. The US taxpayer was paying a big bill, and if it didn't work, whose head was going to roll? That is there behind the scenes all the time. So the pressures that have come now on scientists to have to satisfy the funders is certainly there. Well, and I, I would just say, you know, it's interesting to hear you talk that way. I'm writing a book about an engineer and what you're describing. In a way, it's as much an engineering yes. Yes. project, a project of that kind of scale, where, again, you have a government looking over a budget. Yes. This is the task to be accomplished. That's industrial. Absolutely. I, I'd like to point that out, in fact, that the science of the atomic bomb was, relatively speaking, quite simple. There was no secret to the atomic bomb. Everybody knew it pretty well, but it was an engineering project. So it's the engineers that are at fault. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, they always say that, don't they? 
Um, Alec, let me come to you. So, so back to your point about a kind of optimis optimistic view about the, the potential of science. Does the, and you saw the play last night. Has that changed your view? <laughs> what, do you, what, what does the Manhattan Project make you think about modern science? What is the relationship for you, given you, you think about this all the time? Well, you asked, uh, Frank, about the implications for, of the Manhattan Project to science, and you know, you articulately talked about the collaboration, and that's yeah. one aspect of it. Um, what happens, of course, after the Manhattan Project is that um, the world... Uh, who the, the, the people of the world who maybe don't know what science is or what scientists do are suddenly aware of this one particular thing that scientists what scientists do. Uh, the scientists themselves, and it's reflected upon in the play, wonder what they've created. And there are some interesting stories about those people moving away from anything to do with war, uh, for example, going into biological science, for example, etc. Um, um, but but what happens is that you you have this incredible PR disaster for science. Um, and there's this idea that this is what scientists do. Of course, that's not what all scientists do, and, uh, uh, but, but uh, th this is where publicly funded science comes from. The, the governments start funding huge amounts of science, and now the paradigm we know of where governments fund most science in, in this country and, and many others c comes from the 50s and so on. And there was a huge um, sort of PR exercise afterwards to sort of try and reform science as this great hope, the white heat of technology. Um, these are the people that are going to save the world. We're going to have, if you think about the 50s and 60s, you had visions of the future with jet cars and jet packs and things. It was all because there was a, a particular attempt to get science away from this idea of destruction into something very pr progressive and, and futuristic. The other uh, aspects of it, of course, CERN comes out of uh, government's attempts to stop Russian scientists building the bomb, essentially. Uh, the fusion reactor being built at CERN is something similar. Uh, so, sorry, uh, fusion reactor being built at in the south of France is being something similar. Uh, uh, the space race comes out of um, an attempt by governments, again, to show superiority and also give, uh, give them a cover to building intercontinental ballistic missiles that deliver nuclear bombs. I mean, huge implications about what the potential of this thing is. Uh, I think what is optimistic about it is that CERN is a very optimistic idea. Yes. It, it's a very peaceful place. Uh, and if you speak to any of the scientists there, uh, they talk about how it is meant for peace. One of the things they talk about is that it's meant for a peaceful use of this technology. Of course, who knows what people might be able to use the Higgs boson for in a, a thousand years' time, but you know, the, the, it is a peaceful use. Um, the fusion reactor, as I mentioned again, in, in the south of France, which is an international project, again, it's a peaceful use of nuclear energy. Um, and so I think that the collaboration, all these things made people, made scientists especially, and governments and all sorts, think that they had to work harder to persuade the rest of us that um, there, was, there, were, there were things that scientists could do beyond, beyond this one horrible, uh, I don't want to say horrible, this dangerous thing. But, uh, what you were saying reminded me actually, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Will Self was on the radio for a quarter of an hour every lunchtime taking his tour around CERN. And on the first or second day there, he was in the CERN canteen. And it was a very hard job, obviously, selling him the idea. I mean, the first mistake that was made was that they put a PR person on rather than a young scientist, which is the, the young scientists are the people who are excited and will tell you how it really is. Um, and Will Self knew that. And then he said, well, all you ever did for us was make the bomb that killed everybody. What do you say about that? You know. And I thought, well, the answer was, let me introduce you to this Japanese colleague of mine who's working on the experiment with me today. The fact that CERN was built, that the concept came up within five years of the end of the war involving all the things that we see happening on the stage last night and that countries that have been fighting each other just so a few years before were now working collectively together. I think as a political enterprise, it was as successful as a scientist. Scientific one. Um, Tom, can I just pick up on, in this conversation about a kind of pessimism and optimism, obviously, obviously dreadful things came, as we talked about at the beginning, from this decision to pursue the bomb and use it, but, al but also we're sort of touching on a thought that perhaps it's given us a kind of more reflective and more public relationship with science. Wait, having written the play and the experience of having it staged, how do you now feel about those events? I mean, is it as, is it as complex as that, or is it, um, or more so, or do you have a clear view on its impact? Yeah, it's tricky. I spend three hours in essentially um, discussing it with myself, which is what <laughs> people see, and I don't think I come to any hard and fast conclusion. No. Uh, it's it's uh, it, it it comes down to the to um, the extraordinary coincidence that atomic fission was discovered at the start of the world's first fully industrialized war. Yeah. I think had the world would have been in very a different place if um, Hahn and Strassmann hadn't kind of um, been breaking apart uranium atoms. Um, 
in Germany in 1939 if they'd kind of done it 10 years later. Yes. Um, but that's just what if -ing. That's mm. kind of spending your entire time uh, looking at, well, what would the world be like if we hadn't bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, mm. uh, if, if um, the, well, the Nazis weren't, um, weren't uh, their atomic program wasn't really coming to anything, so if the Americans had just not invested in it, the, how would the world have been different? Yeah. Um, and it's, it, it comes back to the idea of the players do you believe that what is um, possible is inevitable? Yes. And I think the, the real um, fear at the time from the, from the scientists um, was that the Nazis were ahead. Yeah. They had Heisenberg, they had um, they, the, the, all the scientists like Hans Better, who, um, who was kind of coming over from Europe, um, kind of had first-hand experience of, of, um, of fascism. Yes. And um, there was a real... Um, belief that the Nazis could not mm. be allowed to have the bomb. And, um, and so that fervor drove mm. the American project. Um, and yeah, it's, 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 it's a really difficult um, moral question that I don't think I've, I, I still don't have an answer for, but okay. this is the history that we have. Yeah. Can, Can I just add something to please, you yeah. that of all the people who were distressed by what happened, uh, it wasn't the people at Los Alamos it was Hahn, the German himself, who when discovered that the atomic bomb had been dropped, and for the first time the German scientists realised the possibility, it was Hahn who felt that having discovered the phenomenon of fission, that it was his responsibility that had opened up this terrible thing. Goodness me, yeah. and what a responsibility to bear to think that you, you had begun a process yeah. that was indeed inevitable, that someone else had picked it up on the other the, side of the world. The, the other thing which people might have some insight into to explore is that, as, as Tom said, the project was to build a bomb before the Nazis did. Yes. And a substantial percentage of the scientists on there were Jewish emigres from Nazi Europe, which I always thought was one of the great ironies yes. of what Hitler achieved for German science. He sent it all over here. But the thing was that when it became clear that Germany was going to lose the war, and more important, that they had not made any significant progress on an atomic weapon of their own. The prime reason for building the bomb no longer existed. Yet only one scientist left the project. That was Joe Rotblatt, who later got the, the Peace Prize many years later. But with his exception, they all continued. And, of course, one of the ways was that Oppenheimer impressed upon them that there are reasons for doing this that... And the, the reason that was eventually given for using it against Japan was we have the choice of losing a million uh, US military invading Japan or dropping a bomb. And one of the things also that I discovered in preparing for this, I was reading Ray Monk's 700-page <laughs> book about Oppenheimer, but the firebombings of Tokyo that had taken place uh, not far in advance of the atomic bomb itself had already killed 20,000 people. And... I'm just making this up as I go along, but I can imagine that to the extent that the young kids thought about this at that stage, this new bomb was perhaps not going to be qualitatively different. Yes. It was one bomb that would do what thousands of bombs were doing. And yes. Oppenheimer also, I mean, being aware that this would give radiation, that he had advised that the Japanese would probably not feel much radiation effects because they were going to air raid shelters the moment they were aware the air raid was on. And of course, there wasn't an air raid, there was one plane. Yes. And, you know, air raids involve hundreds of planes and people going to shelters. There was one plane, and they all looked up wondering what this one plane was doing. And these were things that people didn't anticipate beforehand, and after the event, it's all very obvious. Yes. You, you, you touch on something there, I think, which um, is very powerful in the play, the kind of flavour of understanding quite what they'd done. Not, of course, that they'd invented a bomb that could kill so many people, but what that bomb was like, was of a completely different order and experience. And I suppose it seems to me, Tom, that you, you quite rightly don't land on a moral conclusion, but you do land on an emotional conclusion in the play that the move from the kind of idealism, we haven't really talked about the politics in the play, those of you who've seen it, it's a very important part of the play, that uh, Oppenheimer is associated both before the Manhattan Project and later uh, with communist uh, ideas and ideals and indeed with the Communist Party and many close colleagues and that 
kind of uh, uh, political idealism seems towards the end of the play to be translated into a, a, a dreadful sense of the, of the loss of innocence and that idealism is not possible. Is that, is that fair? Well, that's pretty bleak, isn't it? <laughs> it is pretty bleak. It does upset uh, me, I must say. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah I think uh, looking at the arc of, um, of the character of Oppenheimer in my play, is it's a journey from idealism to cynicism. Yeah. And, um, and uh, the lines he has at the end of the play, um, which I don't want to give away, no. but uh, he's, it's... It's uh, it, the decisions he's made. He's he's consciously kind of given up on his idealism to do this thing, yeah. and um, and it's it's tough. It's it's a tough thing that I think every everyone goes through as you get older. Your youthful idealism gets stripped away by just living and just kind of existing. And this is a very extreme um, example of that. Tom is a shockingly young man to be saying such a thing, but Erica, do, do you agree? No, I, I do mm. agree, and I would just, you know, interject that that's sort of returning to what I was saying before. I think that's one of the ways in which the construction of a story can make really challenging material like this accessible to us because, as you were just, you know, to some extent, that happens to us all in less, we hope, perhaps dramatic circumstances, but that's a journey which, as an audience member, you can understand. You start off with a particular way of how things are going to go, and funnily enough, they don't really go that way. Um, and so that's a way in for audiences to the story. I and mean, this brings us back to why these stories are intriguing. And I, I just wonder, Alec, partly because you, you talked about the, the, the optimism, the positive results or, 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 or um, later developments in science. I wonder, you, do you think that there's something around progress that um, we nearly lost? Your, your point about the big PR disaster around science immediately after the Manhattan Project. And I was talking to a scientist who saw the show the other night. He was saying, actually, for him, there's something about science which believed in the inevitability of progress. So it was always going to be to the positive, to, to explore the next idea and the next idea. Have, do, have we retained that, or was it, in a sense, lost forever? Well, I think if you ask many scientists who do science because they're interested and they talk about blue skies and curiosity-driven research, then, then yes. I mean, and, and CERN is a classic example of that. It's purely abstract in many ways and curiosity-driven, although it has managed to engage quite a lot of people who are not interested in theoretical physics yeah. per se. Um, so, yeah, uh, in, uh, progress is there. Uh, and, and, and one of the themes of the play and, and of this discussion is about whether um, things are inevitable. I mean, if... if um, fission hadn't been discovered in 39 by, by the scientist in question, someone else would have done it. Uh, f two years later, five, uh, five years later, I mean, lots of discoveries in science seem to, be, seem to happen around the same time independently of each other because the time seems to be right. I don't want to get spiritual about it or anything, but there is sometimes an inevitability about a certain discovery or a certain thing because of some technology or some idea circulating and so yes. on. Um, and I think that... Um, we stick with that today in, in lots of respects. People are now more competitive when it comes to science and the way they do it. Uh, they want to publish in great journals and that's all depend, uh, that's all, I mean, the way the science is done now is, is uh, because it's government funded and you have to get amazing results in amazing journals, that all this competition means that um, that's all that scientists do in some uh, respect. Um, and it's hard to see then how you then attach these sort of abstract ideas to it all. Um, but um, I, I, I think that, to, to answer your question, yes, th these things are inevitable, these things will happen. If you don't do something, someone else will. And it's just getting bigger and bigger and more people do it. And it, you have, the only contribution you can make is so tiny nowadays in these big collaborations or by yourself that, uh, yeah, it, it's an unstoppable machine. Can, can I just add one thing to, yes, to Alex's remark there? Because you know, the what-if aspect, um, people have often said, if fission had been discovered, say, later, would the atomic bomb have happened from it because the enterprise was so big it required the war to do it, etc., etc.? And I think the answer is yes, it would, because one of the things that I discovered while I was researching this latest book was that the Soviets, of course, they started their own atomic bomb project not in order to have it ready in the Second World War, because they thought this was something that would take much longer to develop, but that Stalin saw this as a hedge for future wars. So I think that that experience shows that it would have led to that development, whatever, whenever, whenever it was found. 
of course, there are very chilling moments in the play, again, hoping not to spoil too much for you, but um, that just allude to the, the Cold War and the fact that no one had imagined that such a, such a thing would happen, that that relationship would be there for so long between the Soviet Union and America. Well, I don't know if you agree, Frank, but I mean, in terms of inevitability, if it's just one thing, I can't think of a single scientific idea that, even though we, we associate them with individual people or groups, wouldn't have happened if that person had not been alive, except for general relativity, perhaps, which is Einstein. And I don't know if, you, maybe you can say, whether that would have come along from someone else. Oh, what an interesting <laughs> question. Well, it's funny, I mean, I had that idea, then discovered it had already been done. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think, I think that, I mean, general relativity is often cited as the one thing, and perhaps that, that is true. Um, what, again, does come across well, and this is alluded to in the programme notes, so you'll see it anyway, was the, the world politically was very different in the 1930s. You're in a world where the Spanish Civil War is happening. Are you a fascist or are you anti-fascist? That was really the decision that people had to make. And, of course, 20 years later, as the world had changed and McCarthyism has arrived, the decisions that people made in their 20s during the 1930s come back to haunt them in later life. And clearly, one of the things which troubled many of the scientists uh, was the fact that the Soviet Union were allies of America and Britain. Again, one of these obvious facts, but which is often overlooked, that people think, oh, why wasn't Klaus Fuchs executed? Answer, because he wasn't a traitor. He passed information to an ally, not to an enemy. And there was a great feeling among the scientists that freezing the Soviet Union out of this work was sort of wrong. Of course, that was the political decision that was made. Uh, and there's a bit of a sort of Pontius Pilate effect here, I think, that the scientists were doing their thing, and it was the politicians who were deciding what you do with it. So, yes, scientific discovery, by definition, is progress, because you end up knowing things about what is possible than you knew before. What you do with that is then the decision to be made. And I will come to you any moment, I promise. And I just want to ask Angus, in the light of this discussion, in essence, do you think this is a play about science? <laughs> or, or something else besides? I, 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 that's a, it's a very good question. I said about halfway through rehearsals, I thought it was a play about leadership. And, you know, obviously we're, we're here at the, the RSC and um, a lot of those Shakespeare history plays are, are, are about, I, I could argue, are about leadership. Yes. Um, and I think that uh, I think that's very interesting. And talking to I, um, I, I, I did study physics, and two of my tutors have been involved: Dave Walk and uh, John Butterworth. Um, and they will talk endlessly about the organisation of scientists uh, and how difficult it is. Um, and I, I think uh, you get to a point uh, again, which, which, which I try not to talk too much about the play, but where he's you know at the top of the mountain, there's room for only two feet. Where Oppenheimer's running. Uh, these other scientists who are his competitors and his at least equals in, 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 in ways. So for me, a lot of the play is about that. Yeah, no, I, that's absolutely right. And that does seem to me why it sits very well on the stage because Shakespeare also writes about very conflicted and ambivalent leaders yes. and leaders with great talents, but those talents being <laughs> the other side of that coin being hugely dangerous. Um, I am now going to try and hand over a little bit to the audience, although I'm sure uh, all of us have lots more to say. But um, what are your questions? I'm only a little bit afraid of what they might be. Please do put your hands up and we'll... Um, yes, the lady at the front. I'd like to ask Tom, I haven't seen the play yet, but I have seen quite a few modern plays which have tried to get a point across and quite often about science. And they've fallen into the trap of leaving me feeling as though I've been beaten about the head with a baseball bat. How, as a um, writer, do you prevent yourself, which I assume you have, uh, in not falling into that trap? He has. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I hope that people don't come out being felt that they've been beaten up, though um, by the end... You do feel a bit of that, but that's... Emotional. Emotional. But in a good way. Emotionally, emotional, exactly, emotional in a good way. way. <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I'm... There is no um, agenda I'm pushing with this play. I wanted to explore um, all the arguments because it's such a, a morally grey um, area. Uh, the things that, that, you know, there is no right answer to the question of was it the right thing to do? There's no correct answer. It's just, well, this is what they did. Is, is it better? Is it worse than what could have happened? But it's, it's an unanswerable question. And, um, and I hope that um, 
because lots of people, everyone kind of has an opinion, no matter how little they know about J. Robert Oppenheimer, yes. people kind of turn up with what they think at the start. I hope that, I, uh, that by airing all of, uh, as many arguments as I can surrounding uh, those questions, that it maybe pushes people to think about it from the other angle. And I, I suppose one um, uh, unusual thing about the play, when we talk about a big play, it's got a quite a big cast. And so Tom has handled a remarkable range of characters. And that helps enormously, because then, scene by scene, you see very different perspectives. I mean, not least coming into the room with, with Oppie. But also, actually, uh, in relation to the Manhattan Project, so some of the things that... Frank was talking about, about the innocence and, um, uh, and wonderful energy and enthusiasm of the very young scientists. Immediately gives you another perspective on what you might think is a foregone conclusion about a, a, terrible, a terrible act or the, the terrible effects of an event. That you, see, you see this wonderful eagerness. So immediately, emotionally, you're in a different place. And there are many other perspectives that, again, we won't spoil. But Erica, do you have a perspective on how one tells these very complex moral stories without lecturing? Well, I think a word that Tom used just now is explore. Mm. Um, I think that's, um, you know, in my experience, and I've been uh, privileged in my career to talk to a lot of really wonderful writers, and I think, you know, this doesn't um, just apply uh, to the wonderful play I saw last night, but I think of talking to Margaret Atwood about her Mad Adam trilogy, which is about what happens in a, in a future Earth. Um, she is exploring what those possibilities might be rather than saying, and this is what I think. That I think that's what you're referring to. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the trick. It is a, it is a hard trick to, to pull off, but that's, to me, what the best plays do. I mean, you talked about Stoppard at the beginning. You know, Arcadia is a great example of a play that interrogates, uh, you know, ideas that are out there, they're less perhaps morally pressing than what we saw um, tonight. But absolutely, when, when I you know, saw the play, um, I did think that's one of its great strengths was that I wasn't being told what to think. And when we get it right, the theatre is a perfect place to do that. I mean, Shakespeare is a great um, uh, emblem of how, how to explore very complex moral positions. And we are uh, just about to go to rehearsals for Merchant of Venice and Othello, two of the plays that require perhaps more than the others, uh, a, a sense of heartfelt um, belief and in, interest in characters who are less than morally uh, pure, you know, about to, do about to do things or do do things that we might abhor, but which we f who we find charismatic en route. So I suppose we might be in the right place to try. <laughs> Another question. Oh, oh, oh. Lots of hands, sorry. Yes, sir. Thank you. Great question. I hope everybody could hear but why Tom chose not to include in the play, and therefore we're not spoiling anything, um, <clears throat> the events that surrounded Oppenheimer in the early 50s around his security clearance, which are alluded to earlier in the play. But, Tom? That would have to be another play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's um, I mean, that, uh, that whole period and the, um, the relationship with uh, his relationship with Edward Teller, how it developed, and um, how hard he argued against the hydrogen bomb being developed, and, and how that led to his security clearance being taken away from him, and um, how all of the stuff that happens at the beginning of the play with his um, involvement with um, uh, communist associates and, and um, associations, uh, that all comes, comes back to bite, um, bite him on the behind kind of in the 50s. And, the, t the building of the atom bomb is a huge 
you know, I've, I've managed to kind of condense quite a lot into three hours to then try and uh, do all of McCarthyism and, and, the, and the, um, <laughs> the politics of the hydrogen bomb in, in, into that same three hours, then, uh, we, well, we'd be here all night. So. Yeah, we've, we've been very tough on Tom, making sure that it, it fitted just within three hours. <laughs> so that's a very good answer. But, but how much, I come to Erica again, because I wonder how much do you think those later events in Oppenheimer's life have influenced the way we think about him beyond the play? Oh, I, I think enormously. But, I mean, as Tom said, I think that's a very different story. And, I, I, you know, I wonder if that's to do... I had some uh, conversations with um, Graham Farmelow, a physicist who I was di discussing this event with, about, you know, the perception of him. You know, I'm in, in the United States, which is where I'm from, um, although I haven't lived there for a very long time. Um, but... You know, you know, I think still there are people whose reputation is kind of clouded, obscured yes. by what happened during that McCarthy period. I think maybe particularly um, in the realm of science where um, a general audience has less of an understanding uh, of what was actually going on. But I think that's absolutely true. But yes, that's, that's another three hours, isn't it, at least? <laughs> I was just to add something. This, this is a story that I was reminded of as you were saying about Oppenheimer. About 25 or 30 years ago, I went to Los Alamos and I was waiting in the Albuquerque airport to get the little commuter plane. And there was only one other person standing there waiting with me and I started talking to this guy. And I said, what's your name? His name was Oppenheimer. It turned out he was a member of the family and he was at college and he was traveling around the states visiting all the places. And so there's only one place to stay in Los Alamos even today. That's the Los Alamos Inn. It really is a, a Hicksville out in the middle of nowhere. And I was rather amused. I said, you must check in first. I wanted to see the reaction at the desk. <laughs> and he checked in. Nothing at all. Oh, no. <laughs> well, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's a good thing. Another question. Yes, sir. Do. Yes, I was intending to, absolutely. Gus, are you there? Uh, perhaps we could just ask you to tell us a little. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this. Well, it's, it's very interesting. I'm, uh, I, I suppose I'm the only person here and... and far afield to have known Oppenheimer personally. Uh, I was a child of five. I've, he came to my father for his PhD in 1926 when I was five. So you can work out my age now. <laughs> and, uh, and he um, stayed, took his PhD, and then they kept in loose contact until the war. My father refused to work on the bomb, uh, unlike many of his colleagues. He didn't want to do that. Um, and I remember Oppenheimer really quite well, uh, overlaid with lots of stuff, of course, as one is, as it happens when you know somebody as a child. Um, he was a very interesting person. Um, shy and arrogant at the same time. And you can read about him quite well in a couple of books, in my father's biography by Nancy Greenspan, and my father's autobiography, and in the Einstein Born Correspondence, which is another book. Um, and um, that gives you a great deal of information what kind of person he was. This is all long before he got involved in the war as a great leader of the scientists in Los Alamos. Um, I thought the only best thing I can do in a couple of minutes is to read my father's letter to Oppenheimer on his 60th birthday. And that, that'll take a couple of minutes and finish it. Yes, please. And it's Thank quite you. a nice letter. It's dated um, April 19. Uh, 64. Dear Robert Oppenheimer, I'm too old to write an article for your festschrift. Please accept instead a few lines of reminiscences and congratulations. You joined my department in Göttingen in 1926, just after the first papers of quantum mechanics had appeared. It was an exciting and exhilarating time. 
There was a gathering of brilliant young men working on the new methods. It was hard for me to keep abreast of them. It seems uh, it's, if some of them were a little impatient with the professor, I recall the collaboration with you thoroughly enjoyable. I've looked into the volume containing all the doctor's theses made in my department and find your paper, Quantum Theory, of, you know, in German. I now have considerable difficulty reading this very condensed account of your considerations. And I have the suspicion that even then, 37 years ago, I hadn't followed all your in, uh, reasoning. Later, we wrote a paper together and, uh, about quantum, uh, quantum theory of molecules, which has been uh, put into my collected papers. When you left Göttingen, you were so kind as to give me an old, valuable book of Lagrange, which I still have. Um, this has uh, survived all upheavals, evolution, war, emigration, and so on. And I'm glad it's still in my library. It represents very well your attitude to science, which comprehends it as a part of the general intellectual development in the course of human history. Since that day in 1926, I haven't seen you again. And when I've, when I've uh, remained in the narrow domain of university life, you've taken a leading part in great historical events. I followed your public career with deep interest and sympathy, and only because you probably, uh, and only because you proved to be a leader of men and the most efficient administrator, but because I felt that you were uh, burdened with a responsibility almost too heavy for a human being. But this is not the occasion to enter into this, these questions. For nearly, uh, for many years now, you've been back in academic life and pure research and have again been successful. May there be many happy and successful years in store for you, Max Born. Goodness so, me. Uh, Thank you so much. I, Gus, I thank can, you so I, much. In view you of all this better. in the play, I can remember him quite vividly yes. in all his various incarnations. Thank you. That's so extraordinary to hear that. And so many things that we've been talking about this morning. I mean, I'm so struck by that phrase. Um, I, I write with, with interest and sympathy. Extraordinary. So the idea that from not so very far away, he could really see the burden that was placed on Oppenheimer as a scientist. Was, and, and also to Angus's point about being a leader. At, at that, he was obviously very good. Erica. <laughs> Thank but, you but, so much. Can I just add one thing that Frank, you, you said, which was very striking, that Max Born refused to work on the bomb. There were many scientists who did refuse to work on the bomb. Yes. We hear the stories about those who worked on it, but in fact, it's not true that all scientists worked on the no. bomb. Many did not. No, and, and yet 100,000 did. It's just a kind of bewildering, isn't it? No, many... Not, not 100,000 scientists. 100,000 people. <laughs> right. 100,000 people. Administrators and things like that. <laughs> oh, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. <laughs> Tom, I, I wonder what that uh, makes you feel. Extraordinary honour to have you here, sir, and to hear that, uh, that letter. I, is that the Oppenheimer that you, you recognise? I'm aware that Gus is rather frighteningly, is going to see the show this afternoon. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, no, that's an, it's an incredible um, thing to hear. Um, I think one of the, the difficult, the, one of the challenges about writing this play um, was that so many of these characters, so many of these scientists, because of their historical importance, have um, started to um, make the transition from fact into myth. Yes. And, um, yes. <laughs> and this story has been told before in different ways, in operas, in films, in TV shows. Um, and, um, and what I've written is not a documentary. It is uh, the, the retelling of that myth. Yes. And, um, and so it's, it's a fine line of trying to do justice and pay respect to, um, to the real life characters that they were. Um, and also to find out uh, what it is about them and their roles in the story uh, that resonates with humanity at yes, large. Yes. And um, and 
finding that, that balance between fact and myth Absolutely. is hopefully what I've managed to do. I, I, I was, so. I was just going to add, because of course Tom is modest and can't say this about his own work, but it was very striking um, for me to hear Mr. Bourne uh, describe that balance between the sort of combination, odd combination of shyness and arrogance, which I absolutely yeah. think yes. is in the play. And it's, a very, it's an unusual combination and something hard to convey. So that was very striking to, to hear. It, it, it's interesting. I wonder, again, probably for a discussion for another time, but whether we think it's odd because we sort of polarised our, our heroes, <laughs> when, in, when in fact a combination of arrogance and shyness can be quite a, quite a helpful way to get things done. But um, <laughs> Another question. Sorry, did somebody, did somebody at the front have their hand up? Yes, sir. Yeah, one of the things that sort of struck me going through the initial discussion is the probably inextricable link between scientific development and the political you know, establishment framework or whatever. Um, and at you know, this point that some scientists refused to work on the bomb, yes. many of us didn't, which to me plays to this point about the inevitability, uh, inevitability of progress. So whatever is there to be discovered will be discovered. It's just uh, a matter of time. And that um, the, mo the most scary aspect of, of any development is where you get a perfect alignment between political interest that is driving scientific development when the scientists themselves may not always know where they're going because it's curiosity, it's intellectual stimulation development and sometimes when they get to a destination they become you know, very frightened by what they've developed but you can't unknow what you then know. And I just wondered whether we have any sense whether the, the sort of political world today is a different world. Mm. When you look back, at, you know, because some military historians argue that America wouldn't have lost a million men in defeating Japan in the Second World War, and that actually the reasons for dropping the bomb were nothing to do with winning the war, were everything to do with establishing the principle that the atomic bomb worked yes. and creating fear in the rest of the world to leave America in a uh, sort of primary superpower race. I don't know the answer to that, but I'm just interested in this sort of political scientific kind of um, function. Uh, for those of you who didn't, didn't hear the question, I won't repeat it all, but a, a, a really interesting sort of summing up of the intertwining of the political world and atmosphere into which these, these scientific developments found themselves. I, I'm going to come to Alec first, actually, uh, given that you, you, you write about science now and indeed in the context of our news and our, and our political and our literary environment. Do, do, do you think it's changed vastly? Do you think we are, that science is bound up with politics in the way that it was then and has been ever since? Uh, small p politics, absolutely, um, in the day-to-day, -day, in terms of how you get your money. You have to predict, as a scientist, what your use of research will be useful for, even if you don't actually end up doing what you said you're going to do with that money. I mean, that's probably an in-joke for scientists more than anyone else. But, um, um, uh, but, but yes, uh, capital P politics, uh, absolutely. Uh, look, at the, look at America, the greatest country in the world for science, but weirdly polarised when it comes to things like climate change or stem cell research, or those sorts of things. Um, uh, the, the UK, um, you know, number two in the world of science, um, but as every government will tell you, we, we do great impact and things with our, with our small amounts of money, um, has, has um, less political interference, although that's changing somewhat uh, of late as governments have started to decide where the money's going to be focused. So we win a Nobel Prize in um, a, a few years ago in graphene, and so all the money seems to be going to graphene without anyone really realising what, where that should be going or how it should be organised. There's a lot of political interference with science, um, interference, I mean, interaction with science, and that's a good thing. Um, uh, the, one of the advisors to this play, John Butterworth, um, who was your tutor, he um, t writes, talks very eloquently um, over the last few years of becoming politicised, i.e. realising how politics works and being able to interact with it in a way that gets funding, essentially. And all scientists have to be interacting with these things. Um, just one small point about controversial type science. A few years ago, um, scientists in Holland and the US genetically modified the flu virus to H5N1 avian flu virus to make it infectious between people. It's a very dangerous virus in birds, um, but uh, if, you, if, you, if you're, it, it's virulent, virulent in people, if, if you get it, 50% of people seem to die, but it can't spread between people, so it can't produce a pandemic. But they mutated it, and they found that there's five mutations that are necessary in the genetic code of this thing to um, make it transmit between people. And the it, the US security services immediately shut that research down, which the, uh, said you can't publish this work in anywhere. You cannot publish it. Um, 
because terrorists will take this work and, and do something with it. Yeah, and of course, yeah, at our level of conversation, that might sound terrifying, but as these scientists pointed out, number one, the whole point of science is to be open. You have to publish your research because, A, that's how you get your money in the future, and kudos, and scientists are nothing if not seekers of kudos, uh, um, <laughs> to be honest. Where's my credit coming from is what always are asking. It's not about what do I discover about the universe, how do I fit into the REF frameworks of next university cycles and things. That's number one. But number two, um, it's actually quite hard to engineer things and, and make this stuff happen. Engineering is very difficult. The ideas might be easy, but the engineering is difficult. So for two years, there was a moratorium, and eventually they did publish pretty much all of their research, um, and they continue with it. And their argument was, if the pandemic is going to happen, and we see with things like Ebola, pandemics can get, uh, epidemics can get out of control, we need to be on the front foot. We need to know what this virus might look like in future, so we can already start preparing vaccines. The first Ebola vaccine was flown out yesterday. It's too late, to be honest, for this epidemic. Um, what we need is, it takes years to develop these things. So these conversations are always going on between security, politics, and the applications of science. And long may that continue. A wholly part of the point from my point of view, of course, is that this, this conversation itself is quite unusual in this particular funding climate, because if you work in the arts, one is always battling with the idea that we have to choose between science and the arts, um, in education, higher education particularly, so for another time. But it does seem to be that we are, I agree completely, that we are completely bound up in the question of how, how do we see the role of science in our society. Actually, I think some scientists, especially at the edge of theoretical physics and those sorts of things, mm want you to see science a bit like art. Yes. Let's not have any purpose yes. to this. Yes. It's just, this is the expression of human ability in the same way that someone writes a great opera or performs a, a wonderful aria or something, or writes a great play. This is what human minds are capable of. And, and, and to hell with everything else. Or, or at least, uh, there, it exists now, let's talk about it, which well, is your quite. point about the, the, the research into the flu virus. Thank you very much, fascinating answer. We have time, I'm afraid, for one more question, and I will say only this when I get, start to get brutal. If we don't leave the stage on time, then you won't be able to see Oppenheimer this afternoon. No, no pressure. <laughs> so one final question I shall try and scout. Oh, the lady there has been trying to get my attention. Thank you. It's because, Eric, at the beginning, you asked anybody who was young to stand up, and I wanted to return to that and to ask... To what extent has the playwright and the director included the young in their ideas for this production? Oh, what an excellent question. Well, Tom is actually young, is the first <laughs> answer. <laughs> Though Michael Billington makes me a little younger in the review than I actually am, <laughs> is quite interesting. But uh, it was a very good question, and I think we've alluded again um, to the production some of you have seen. There are a lot of, lot of young men and women portrayed, and I think the women very brilliantly, I have to say, very hard to do in a story that seemingly is about, is about men, men leading. Um, but, but young people, therefore, in the company, how much has the thought about young voices been part of making the production, Tom? I think when we um, came to cast the play... Uh, one of the discussions that me and Angus had was very much that we wanted to um, have the, the characters on stage um, as close to the, um, to cast as close to the, the um, actual ages of the, um, of the people they're representing. Because there's something quite shocking about um, this, uh, a, a, about how youthful they all were. And um, Oppenheimer was, in 1939 when the play begins, Oppenheimer's 35. Um, and... And yeah, so that was very important to me um, and, and, and to Angus when we were, we, we were casting. Um, yes, there's a youthful vigor in the play and that, um, that's carried through in the enthusiasm of, um, of uh, how the scientists go about their business. And there's a moment um, about halfway through Act One when um, the first time we see General Leslie Groves mm. and William Gaminara walks on stage and suddenly there's an adult in the room. Yes. And it's quite, it's quite powerful. There's quite a strong sense, isn't there, that, that results in that moment that actually the scientists of a, quite a range of ages ha have a, a, a childlike playfulness in their experimentation. And that's very captivating. And when we think of plays like Copenhagen, of course, they are rather more staid in their approach to the audience. So there's some, for us at the RSC, it's wonderfully um, inviting to a younger audience. But Angus, what, what's it been like for you having, again, quite a young cast and the, their response to telling this story? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I became quite fixated on it. We did a workshop with some brilliant actors, and one in particular was very, very good. And I wouldn't have him because he was, I said, well, no, he's, 
is clearly 40, and it, it's too old. Uh, and I, I mean, I grew up in the environment, you know, where, where I studied, we were, we were around a lot of these people. Um, how have they, I mean, it's brilliant having a young company like this. It's brilliant having some senior figures in it as well, William and Vince, because uh, they, you do like, as an audience, I think it's nice to feel everybody's represented. It, it helps. Um, but it is relatively, Jack Holden's particularly good. Uh, they were all particularly good, but he plays Wilson, who's a fascinating character, uh, who went on to build uh, Fermilab. And what, it, I, I don't know, because you can't, you can't generalize, but their engagement with it is extraordinary. The way they've, uh, John sat uh, on two nights ago, John Butterworth, watched them writing these equations out. And he said to me in the interval, well, yeah, they're all right. <laughs> He actually said plausible, because that's what scientists, uh, you know, it's plausible. And Dave Walk, who's my other tutor, said, well, yuck, because I provided them, John. I, I, it, they're all from Edward Deller's paper. Um, and they just, they've really, really engaged with it. And I'm sure more senior actors would too. But the energy that where you, where you tell them that they're all going to have to learn these incredibly complicated equations... Abs fantastic, 22, 23 year old actors who are, or Jamie Wilkes is brilliant, who has to write one thing whilst saying another, <laughs> both on the subject of, of, um, of nuclear physics. And he said, it's gonna take me a few days, but I will be able to write one thing on the blackboard whilst I'm saying a completely different thing about <laughs> science. So that's the fun of it. Yeah, and, there, and fun is a very important word and perhaps quite a good way to end, actually. If we are to tell these stories, stories, you know, with utmost seriousness of purpose and, and provoking of debates such as this, it's very important that we engage an audience and that there is something to really relish and enjoy and, and slightly fool the eye. And I, 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 I don't know whether uh, the panel have any final comments on this or something else, but um, for me, there's something delightful about not seeing a play about science where everyone's terribly earnest about science all the time. I'm actually really thrilled by the science, <laughs> excited by it. Frank, do you have anything to add to that? You talked earlier on about the importance of remembering how young they were. No, I've nothing to add. I've just got one question. Was Oppenheimer actually left-handed? <laughs> he he was ambidextrous, we do know, yeah. So we John's left-handed, and yeah, we've, this, this is what it's been like. Um, <laughs> so the first thing that happens is he writes his name on a blackboard. With and, his left hand. Yeah, with his left <laughs> hand, because John's left-handed. And we immediately turn around, and, and Alex, I think, who's sitting at the back as our uh, uh, staff director, went, had to go off and find out, and he was ambidextrous. <laughs> There we are. What a brilliant final question. A little insight into the production. Fantastic. Thank you all very much for being a very patient and fascinating audience. And thank you so much to my panel, to Frank, to Erica, to Tom, to uh, Alok and to Angus for being here so early on a Saturday morning. I hope for those of you seeing this afternoon, you really enjoy the show. Thank you.